was one of his most famous cases, defending the Leader magazine against poet Patrick Kavanagh, who was furious at an unflattering and uncomfortably accurate profile of him in the magazine. Well, I was only a student at the time. I was a, a final year student in the King's Inns, and we heard about this case, and some of us went down to it. And my first recollection is the incredible interest it aroused. There were queues all round the round hall in the four courts, uh, in, you know, each day of the trial. Costello asked 1,267 questions or something. He couldn't get a straight answer out of Kavanagh. It appears at all events that the word gurrier that appears in this article was taken from your works. I do not agree. Isn't it quoted in this article? What about it? <laughs> Silence in court. If it comes from the word gutter, what does it mean? That'll be a long story to go into. The meaning of words. <laughs> I mean, he was at the mercy of a master matador, just knowing where to plant the darts. You know, it was Jack Costler was most formidable as a cross-examiner. He was showing how much the uh, article was based on Kavanagh's own writings. And he was also demonstrating that Kavanagh was a less than candid man in, in ordinary layperson's estimation. Kavanagh was devastated at losing the case, but when Costello returned to power soon afterwards, he went out of his way to help his former courtroom adversary. He approached Michael Tierney, the president of UCD, and prevailed upon him eventually to employ Kavanagh as a part-time lecturer. And he leaned on the Arts Council to commission a pamphlet. So he had a modest monthly salary for the rest of his life. Some said it was guilt, others that it was Costello's charitable nature. But for years afterwards, he would give Kavanagh lifts in his state car, sometimes with unusual results. We were passing by the Waterloo in Bagotsey. And Paddy says, I want to get uh, here, to go here, get me, uh, get me a half bottle of whiskey, said Johnny. So I pulled in and went in the pub and got his half bottle of whiskey. He came out and I said, uh, it was 10 to 6, but it's only 10 shillings everywhere else. Well, I said, there's your change. But that is, that is that he had. Uh, de Valera offered him a place on the Supreme Court uh, around about the time of the Kavanaugh case. But do you think he would have made a good judge? Well, it's hard to say. Um, as a politician, he, uh, presiding over two coalition governments, he had to uh, effect all sorts of compromises, obviously. I think it's probably a pity from the point of view of the judiciary that uh, he didn't join the bench. I think he'd have been a very interesting and possibly very impressive judge. But Costello chose politics over the law, and in 1954 he was back in the Taoiseach's office as head of the second inter-party government. It faced horrendous difficulties on the economy and with the IRA's border campaign. But the heaviest blow for the Taoiseach came in 1956, when his wife Ida became seriously ill with heart trouble. I think she was in Vincent's hospital. He was very greatly perturbed. He used to visit her many times in the day. And then, when she died, it was a terror ending for him. It broke up his, his life. A lot of, of, of the punch <laughs> that might be, some people might call gruffness disappeared for a while. And uh, he was very lonely because he and his wife were very close to one another. It was a very united family. By the middle of 1956, the government was in serious political trouble after introducing unpopular austerity measures. We may have gone too far and we've gone too fast, but there is no doubt whatever that they were effective. And then, of course, that was bad enough. The Suez incident came right on top of us. In June 1956, the preliminary census results showed the population of Ireland at the lowest level ever recorded. The national mood was one of unrelieved gloom. Costello recognised the problem in a memorandum for Cabinet. There has emerged a feeling of malaise, some positive action to give grounds for relief for the future. His plans included tax relief for exports, encouragement of foreign investment and more productive capital spending. He launched the proposals in a speech in October 1956. He made it just across the road in the engineer's hall. That was the first political plan for economic change and improvement uh, that was published in the country. 
in quite some detail. But the government's economic plan came too late. It was about to lose power thanks to the IRA's border campaign. When Costello ordered a crackdown on the IRA, Sean McBride withdrew his support in the Dáil, making a general election inevitable. Costello was heavily defeated by de Valera. He retired from the Dáil in 1969 but kept active at the bar. From the sidelines, he retained his passion for politics as he showed at the Fine Gael Ardèche just a year before he died. I have left politics now for some years, enjoyed myself, away from the hurly burly of political affairs, but sometimes I do feel an urge to get back. <laughs> sometimes I get really annoyed at some of the things that are going on. I wish to sit and be back in the dial to say what I precisely think of certain people. Certain people. He died in January 1976 at the age of 84. As a former Taoiseach, he was entitled to a state funeral, an idea quickly rejected by his family. It was automatic, it was instant decision by us all. It was so out of character. And uh, my father hated uh, pomp and ceremony. This reflected Costello's modesty, a modesty which in time saw him fade from public memory. In 1975, he'd been made a Freeman of Dublin along with his great political rival, Eamon de Valera, the two men being treated as equally deserving of the honour. 35 years later, in the public mind, Costello has almost been forgotten. There's plenty to criticise in Costello's political record, the mishandling of the Declaration of the Republic and of the Mother and Child Scheme, the failure to take swifter action to deal with the economic crisis of the mid-1950s. But there's plenty to praise as well, not least his skill in holding two coalition governments together. As a reluctant Taoiseach, Costello didn't choose his cabinet, they chose him. And despite their strong personalities and clashing egos, he kept them together far longer than anyone anticipated. He had no sense of uh, high dignity. It was to be a colleague of John Costello was of itself a status and a shield. I think you will find a legacy in the uh, reports, you know, in the legal reports of the cases which involve huge legal principles. I think that's probably an important legacy I and mean, that he, he, and he fought so many major constitutional cases. As people assess, as, as they will, uh, the performance of the different Taoiseachs, I believe he will be regarded as being in the first grade because there were quite an amount of social and political changes made. That was John A. Costello. Say you will. Starting this Sunday at half past nine, Owen McDonnell is back as Garda Sergeant Jack O'Driscoll, and work is the least of his problems. That's the new series of Single Handed starting this weekend.